In this lecture, we'll look at Unix pipes, which are a way for one process to write output, which is read directly by another process without having to use a file. We'll start by having a process set up a pipe to itself in this segment, and then progress to setting up pipes between two processes in the next. Before we get into the details of pipes, though, let's talk a bit about interprocess communication. It's often useful for processes to communicate information from one to another. For instance, a process might complete one portion of a computation and relay its results to another process to do the next portion, or a sequence of processes, each designed to do one step of a complex problem, might want to pass work from one to the next in a sort of assembly line fashion. Now, one obvious way to do this might be for the one process to write information to a file, for another process to pick up. This works, but it's slow. Recall earlier discussions on the amazing relative slowness of disk access versus memory access. Also, it requires some way for one process to lock a file while writing to it so the other process doesn't read half-written information. Unix provides such means, but they're complex and error-prone to code. Another way to do this might be for the operating system to arrange an area of shared memory that is mapped into both processes' spaces. We discussed in an earlier lecture the idea that a single copy of a code segment, for instance, might be shared by two processes running the same program. It would appear in both their process space, but be only one actual physical copy of memory. A shared memory block would be similar, but would be readable and writable by both processes, so they could communicate through it. Shared memory is provided by most versions of Unix, and it's a lot faster than a shared file, but it does have the same locking problem. A process writing into the shared memory block needs to lock it so the other processes don't try to read partially written information. Shared files and shared memory are examples of interprocess communication, or IPC. You may have a chance to work with one or both of those in later courses or professionally, but for now we'll start with a less complex, though still widely useful, Unix mechanism for IPC, the pipe. It's quite common for IPC to take the form of one process, as I've diagrammed up here, process A, sending a series of data in queue-like FIFO order to another process, which I've diagrammed as process B. The sending process writes data at its own pace into a queue, usually with some limit on how much can be queued. And the receiving process reads data from the queue again at its own pace. If the uh, sending process gets too far ahead and the queue uh, fills up, then the sending process blocks. It pauses its ex execution until there's room for the next data. If the receiving process gets too far ahead and the queue empties out, then it also blocks until data is available. The two processes might be on the same machine or they might even be on different machines. This arrangement is simpler to keep track of than, say, two processes commonly updating an array in shared memory in random ways. It's easier to keep track of locking and data when one process writes only on one end and the other process reads only from the other end. And while such queued IPC is simple, it's also remarkably powerful. Here's question one. In fact, when you think about it, this sort of queued IPC is far and away the most common form of IPC and is apparently sufficient to support the most sophisticated software system ever created, indeed the most complex intellectual artifact in human history. You use queued data or queued IPC routinely. Indeed, you're probably using it right now. How? What am I referring to, do you think? Coming back from a pause, as is possibly obvious, I'm referring to the Internet. Every time your browser fetches a page from a web server, or a lecture from a web server, it uses a form of queued IPC. The browser sends a URL, technically a full HTTP GET or POST request, in queued order to the server. The server responds on a separate IPC queue with the required page or other content. So, queued IPC is good enough for the Internet, at least. Internet client and server code arranges its IPC via system calls that set up something called a TCP IP socket, 
Now, once again, this is something you may encounter in later courses, but the pipe we'll discuss is even simpler than that. A socket allows queued IPC between processes on different machines, even at a great distance. But a pipe assumes both processes are on the same machine and that the IPC queue between them can be set up by a common parent process. Okay, so with that general picture prologue out of the way, let's look at the system calls to create and use a pipe. We'll start with a process that creates a pipe and acts as both the writer and the reader. So modifying this diagram a bit here, let's do that. In a later example, we'll expand the pipe to go between two processes. Now, the pipe system call on line 10 creates a pipe. As you can see, pipe takes a two-element array, FDs, it fills in both elements of the array with file descriptors. In a sense, it's a double open call, returning descriptors for what the rest of the code will treat as two open files. Element FDs0, right here, is uh, set to a file descriptor for reading. And FDs1, FDs1 gets the file descriptor open for writing to the pipe. Note, for instance, the read and write calls using FDS 0 and 1 on lines uh, 11 and uh, 12 here. Now, as you can see by the output of uh, line 10 in our example and in the diagram output down here, the read and write file descriptors for the pipe are actually 3 and 4. Here's question one, just to kind of do a reality check on this question too, I should say. Uh, why is it reasonable and not surprising that exactly those two file descriptor numbers should have been returned by the pipe call? Why not others, higher or, or lower perhaps? Coming back from the pause, well, from prior lecture you know that file descriptors 0, 1, and 2 are for standard input, output, and error, respectively, and they're generally set up at the start of the process. So it makes sense that the reading and writing ends of this newly created pipe would be the next two file descriptors in order. So let's fill those in there. So is the pipe actually opening files? No. Recall that file is a very flexible concept in Unix and read and write can work with quote-unquote files that are actually keyboards, terminals, etc. The pipe system, uh, the pipe system call, causes the kernel to set up a small in-memory queue, as shown in the diagram here, with a file descriptor FDS1 to write to it and another FDS0 to read from it. To the program, it looks like two open files, but read and write operations on those files are implemented as adds to or removes from this pipe queue. So on line 11, we are writing six characters, including the terminating ASCII null at the end of hello, into the pipe. And on line 12, we read up to 100 characters from the pipe, from the pipe into a buffer. As you know from our binary I.O. lectures, read may fail to read as many bytes as we ask for, and it returns the number actually read. In this case, as you can see, by uh, line 13's uh, output, which is down on line 38, we read just the six bytes that were put into the pipe on line 11. So what would happen if we tried to read from a pipe that had no data? Say if we did another read call here on line 14. The read call would block. It would not return at all until there was data in the pipe to return. In our case, that would result in a deadlocked process since we would not be able to do any write calls while we're blocked. Generally, it's another process that is writing, so that isn't a problem. Now, similarly, if we do a write to a pipe, but there's insufficient room to accommodate what we want to write, the write call blocks until the reader has removed enough data from the pipe. The size of the pipe queue varies, by the way, per Unix implementation from 4K to as much as 64K. It's generally larger in newer Unix versions. 
When we're done writing to or reading from a pipe, we close the file descriptors, as for any other file. Closing file descriptors changes the blocking behaviors described above. If there are all, uh, if all the right uh, file descriptors, all the file descriptors for writing on a pipe are closed, and if the pipe is empty of data, then a read call on the pipe returns zero without blocking. And as you know from prior lecture, a zero return from a read indicates EOF. So one may reach EOF when reading a pipe, even though it's not really a file. But this happens only when all data from the pipe has been read, and there's no hope of future data being written because all writers are closed. Otherwise, <clears throat> a read on an empty pipe blocks, <clears throat> as already described. Now, writing to a pipe that has no open readers, by the way, whether or not there is room, causes a runtime fault, a broken pipe. We'll see how to handle this fault in a later lecture, but for now the effect is to end the process doing the offending write immediately as a, as a runtime fault.